Welcome. Welcome. Welcome aboard, people wandering in. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Godek. I come from uh, Austin, Texas. I'm a developer. Um, I've been doing Drupal stuff since around 2001, something like that, and a dev for a long time before that. And uh, I work for ThoughtWorks, which is a global software company. I'm just a little guy in a big company in that sense. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about continuous delivery. So, but I wanted to uh, try to get a little f feedback in here. Like, how many how many people in here are? We're going to go over some like roles, right? Roles are like dev, QA, project manager, um, other, right? So, how many devs? You can be more than one. A lot of devs, right? QAs, dedicated QAs, not a one. Um, and uh, like business analyst, project manager. Right, it's back in there, and like bosses, right? I mean, he's <laughs> like, yeah, I'm the boss, right? It's coming up. Are there so any other roles? Any other roles that that I didn't cover right in there? People that just wandered in off the street for coffee or anything else, right? So, um, and how many people here are like doing continuous integration today, right? And anybody doing continuous delivery today? CD, right? Going through? Yes. All right. Um, so um, we'll just launch in. There's folks coming in here and everything, but um, there's a lot of material. The, the talk will be, there's like three kind of sections of the talk, right? The, the opening part is the turkey talk, right? And that's because like experts are turkeys, and this is sort of like I'm the expert or something. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm just a, what, an expert's just a turkey. Turkeys get shot. So we'll try to keep that opening part like short. And, but it, we have to go over the why of why we're doing this, right? Because it, it's really kind of, in most of the dialogues I have, it's kind of the most important part. Because people kind of get it that they want to do it, but um, they don't really have the narrative to sell why it is that it's important to invest in getting this work done, right? So we'll cover that first. And then we'll look at a, a particular tool, right? Or this uh, Go platform, and um, not the language. And, um, and then we'll go into some like case study stuff towards the end to try to put it together so to give you not the way that I'm saying that you should do it, but a way that it could be done, so, right? So to try to give it some context. So that's really the, the, the scope of it right here, right? So we launch, right? We'll go in right here, right? What, the first question is, what is continuous delivery, right? And so continuous delivery, uh, we'll call it um, like a technical practice of Agile that's concerned mostly with getting uh, good ideas delivered in the shortest time possible. That's really what we're trying to do, why it is that you want to be doing this stuff. So since it's kind of about this question of time, getting stuff done in the shortest time possible, then um, let's go look at time. So we have the, the time that it takes to get a story. There's, there's some of these terms, like there's story, requirement, um, uh, feature, they're kind of syn synonymous, right? And in our culture, we use, use the word story to say the, re the requirements that we're asking a dev to deliver. So the time it takes to get a story to dev complete is called cycle time. That's your cycle time. How long does it take you from the time you give a, re a requirement to the time you get it's done? And this, the cycle time tells you something about like developer resource utilization. But the larger context is the time it takes from the time an, an idea is originally expressed and a requirement is expressed to the time it's actually delivered for use by a customer. And that's called lead time, right? So continuous delivery is concerned with both cycle time and lead time. But we really want to emphasize lead time because you don't get any return on investment on software until it's actually delivered for people to use it. So the fact that you've got something dev complete, if it's still sitting there not delivered, there's no value in it, right? It's still just an expense that nobody's actually getting any, ben any benefit from. So cycle time, lead time. Um, so here's an image of the product that we're talking about, Go. It's an open source product. And I guess, I'll, let me take a sidebar. We actually have um, two copies of this book right here, uh, Continuous Delivery by Jez Humble and Dave Fairley, uh, who were thought workers at the time they wrote it. And uh, it's really the best book on the subject. It's an awesome book. You should definitely read it. I'm going to give away two copies of this book at the end of this session to whoever tweets the most interesting questions at the hashtag go for CD, G O F O R C D, right? Or, okay, so anyway, two copies are right here. Right? Um, okay, so 
we, so we have this idea, right? We want to get to faster cycle time, faster lead time, faster feedback, continuous delivery. We're going to need some tools to get this stuff done, right, to do this. But, um, and, and so we're going to look at this particular one, Go, go not Go Lang, but Go CD. Um, it was a ThoughtWorks product. It's now an open source project, right? So now you can just go to, it's go, uh, www.go.cd is the community site, and it's on GitHub, and you can get it, install it, and it's yours to use and contribute, et cetera. It's an awesome tool. There's other tools. Hopefully, everything that we present in here, if you decide to use other tools, the concepts are still the same. We want to get, get you to like understand the lay of the land of what CD tools are really about and how to, how to differentiate what you can do with Jenkins with other tools to Electric Cloud or Bamboo or, or Go, right? But Go is awesome. Um, but still, it's like you got to start with this caveat that um, usually the biggest problem with um, uh, getting your organization to over, you know, transition to CD is typically not really the tools. There are usually things to have to do with like organizational change management, architectural issues, process issues, that kind of thing, right? So it's kind of like a big takeaway we're going for here is that we want to leave you with a better sense of what you're trying to achieve in a CD transition so that you can take this question of tools, which are really fun, and put them in the context of all this other work that you have to do in order to actually get to delivery. Because delivery is not just a technical thing. It has to be, the, it's really, a, it involves everybody on the team, from the customer through to dev, everything. So, um, so let's look at uh, CD in the context of Agile, right? Because uh, CD is, um, continuous delivery is born out of Agile, right? So the uh, Agile Manifesto from 2001, the first principle of the Agile Manifesto is, quote, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software, right? So the continuous delivery movement, as we know now, was simply trying to realize that expression from the Agile Manifesto, right? Now, Agile is a term that it's like it's been so, like, abused at this point that often it's kind of hard to know what people really mean when they say it, right? They say, I, we're, I'm Agile, you're Agile, whatever. Uh, so, you know, when we're talking about Agile, we're talking about like an adaptive process as opposed to a predictive process, and we're concerned with like making sure we're building the right thing. That's what we're talking about with Agile. Now, iteration is often like associated with Agile, right? A client's often going to agree to an iterative process in principle, but still, like, they essentially impose this predictive model on the project, right? I want these requirements. You know, oh, we'll do iteration, we'll do agile, everything, but we want these requirements in this period of time, right? And so if you've got this, like, predictive straitjacket on top of an agile process, then you end up with a process that's, uh, for, that really is dedicated to prioritizing and estimating requirements, sorting the requirements into sprints, like maximizing uh, resource utilization, that kind of stuff. So essentially what you have is like a project management process, leaving out a lot of the technical practices that were discussed in, if you go back to what Agile, the intention 2001 forward, right? It's not just the project management processes. There's technical practices such as continuous integration, automated testing, paired programming, unit testing, and continuous delivery are technical practices that are part of Agile, right? And I don't mean to, to state those as, as prescriptive things, like you have to do paired programming to do Agile, but those are technical practices that um, really, uh, you need to be doing parts of those to really get the benefits of an Agile process. And so, you know, typically we get into the discussion of like, why is it that you can't, on your organization, you can't get to these technical practices, and usually it has to do with, like, our customers won't pay for it, you know, the customers won't pay for a client, for quality. Uh, everybody's got their own story, but we hear that part a lot. So, really, to get into this question of context, we'll step back, have the short discussion about this relationship, relationship between quality and productivity, right? And to do that, right, there's this guy, who knows Ed, this guy, uh, W. Edwards Demings, right? Demings is, he was this management consultant and statistician, and he, w he went to World War, he went to Japan in post-World War II period to work with um, standing up, re-standing up manufacturing, and um, he really, he just changed the world of what he did from there. He's an awesome guy, and he's really associated with this, uh, the Toyota production system, right, as a, and Deming, as the, it's hard to separate those two things, 
And so Jez, in, this, in the book, in Continuous Delivery, they start right off. That's why, how I know about Demings, right, when they're reading this book, is that, um, that they talk about uh, the, really the debt that we have today in, in figuring out the software delivery process, the debt we have to Demings work, right? We can still go back to Deming to try to figure out what it is that we need to do now. And so uh, this, in, I'll close this initial part with this quote from Demings. It's a 1982 book. So Reagan, Margaret, Margaret Thatcher, all that is back in that time. And he wrote this book called The Quality, Productivity, and Competitive Position, which is a pretty cool book. He talks a lot about stat, stat, statics and st statistics, and it's focused on the manufacturing process. It's really a pre-software world era at that time. So, um, so here's this Deming quote to try to put this question of, of quality and productivity in, in, in context and continuous delivery. And he said, Deming says, um, our aim is to illustrate with simple examples that productivity increases with the improvement of quality. Low quality means high cost and loss of competitive position. S some folklore. Legend has it that quality and production are incompatible, right? That you can't have both. A typical project manager will tell you that it's either or, right? In her experience, she'll tell you that if she pushes quality, that she'll fall behind in production. If she pushes production, then quality suffers. This will be her experience when she knows not what quality is, nor how to achieve it. A clear, concise answer came in an interview with 22 production workers in response to my question, why is it that productivity increases as quality improves? Right? Less rework. There's no better answer. These workers know how important quality is to their job. And they know that quality is achieved through improvement of the process. That improvement of the process increases uniformity of output of product and reduces rework and mistakes, reduces wasted time and material, and thus increases output with less effort. Now, other benefits of improved quality are lower cost, better competitive position, happier workers on the job, and more jobs as a result of the better competitive position of the company. And these are lessons that management must learn and apply. Reduced waste transfers man hours and machine hours from the manufacturer of defectives to the manufacturer of additional good product, effectively increasing the capacity of a production line. So the benefits of better quality through improvement of the process are thus not just better quality in the long range improvement of market position that goes along with it, but increased productivity and much better profits as well. Now, improved morale of the workforce is another gain because now they see that management is making some effort themselves and not blaming all the faults on the production worker." End quote. So that's, the, that's a quote from the very beginning of Deming's book, right? He's, and obviously most of American manufacturing has missed that whole boat, right? Because they're still stuck in this uh, other crazy model that doesn't really seem to work that well. But Deming is awesome. He's a, it's a guide, right, for where it is we're trying to get to, right? Uh, quality is not something that you're, it's, it's not an extra cost that you're paying for. This is your road to better productivity and better um, uh, competitive position and profitability. And the, the software delivery pipeline is part of the structure to help you get there. So, um, so that's our constant goal in this, right, is to get, to foster a culture of improving the process. Right, if you Google the improvement kata, K-A-T-A, right, there's a whole school of stuff on the improvement kata, right, what that's about, constant, constantly improving the process. And so this is CD practice is all about getting there, and it's about reducing the cost, time, and risk of delivering incremental changes to users. So but that's a lot like, you know, the mountains off in the distance, right? They're really beautiful to behold and everything, but they're a little bit further than they at first appear. So nobody's going to, like, nobody gets a CD overnight, right? It's not like you get a tool and now you're CD, right? Um, your journey's going to take some time. And so you need to, like, focus, figure out what it, why it is you're doing this. Keep that in, in context and measure your progress as you're going along, right? You're shooting for reduced cycle time, reduced lead time, uh, faster feedback on all the way through the process, and uh, to keep the focus on value-added work instead of non-value-added work, which is to say, you know, to try to match your efforts with work that customers are actually willing to pay for, right? So, um, 
the purpose of the tools are to support these efforts of ongoing improvement of the process of building and delivering software. And so in that sense, all of the effort to build, uh, uh, to build this uh, build software, build automation is like a musician's rehearsal, right? So that by the time, it, time it, by the time that you go out on stage, right, then all the technical issues should be resolved at that point, right? You're going out to perform at that point. Um, fully automated deliveries is a, is a goal that you want to get to. If you keep not getting to it right away is not a problem, right? It's a journey that you're going to, to get to where you have fully automated deliveries. Deliveries, you press a button. Nobody has to SSH or shell into anything, touch anything. It just works, and you have rollbacks that are just as easy. So it takes the risk right out of it. Um, so we've, we've introduced this concept of the pipeline now, right? This is software build pipeline. Um, to put it in context, uh, here's a quote from Martin Fowler on, uh, on what we're trying to do with the pipeline, right? To go out, where we go from continuous integration all the way through to production. And so Martin Fowler says, quote, um, one of the challenges of an automated build and test environment is you want your build to be fast so that you can get fast feedback, but comprehensive tests take a long time to run. So a deployment pipeline is a way to deal with this by breaking up your build into stages. Um, each stage provides increasing confidence, usually at the cost of extra time. And early stages can find most problems yielding faster feedback, while later stages provide slower, more thorough probing. And deployment pipelines are a central part of continuous delivery." End quote. All right, Martin Feller. So, um, so let's talk about stages, right? So we got a pipeline is these, are these stages. Um, uh, a pipeline in Go is essentially a container four stages, right? Stages are metadata within the pipeline. Um, and so in our case, this kind of case study thing, we're using four stages, uh, a commit stage, a QA stage, a showcase stage, and a production stage. You know, maybe you'd call them something different. Maybe you'd have three stages or two stages, right? Commit to production, I suppose you could do that, right? Or you could have more stages, depending on what you want to do. It's not important. The important thing is you've got this flow that goes through, right? Um, so here, here's what our stages look like. Now we're looking at a tool, right? We're inside Go, right? Kind of, this is a Go admin dialog, and we're configuring our stages, right? So we get from our concept here to actually configuring the tool. Um, so we have commit, QA, showcase, production stages. The idea is that uh, every time code is committed in trunk, Go is automatically going to rebuild the system, right? It's going to kick off that commit stage. Um, and so the commit stage is continuous integration, right? If you have a Go pipeline with one stage, then you have CI, right? And you have two stages, now you have something more than CI. And Go is like ready to let you grow into that, um, that delivery process. Um, but let, so first let's take, take the sidebar and continuous integration because the, the term gets used in different ways. Um, uh, CI isn't running Jenkins on feature branches, right? It's, it's uh, I mean, because there's two words in continuous integration, right? Continuous and integration, right? And so in order to do continuous integration, you have to be integrating. And running on a feature branch isn't integrating anything. It's just running on a feature branch, right? And so the purpose of CI, one of the things you're really trying to accomplish with, this, with CI and modern build process is, to, is if, you're, if, you're, if you have a stage in your process where you're, doing, you're scheduling time to do merges from feature branches into trunk, then that's kind of a problem at this point, right? You want to get you want to get rid of this whole merge thing, and get it down right at the very beginning. Get developers committing code um, at least once a day or more times a day or more into trunk directly into trunk, and no feature branches only for like experimental spikes or something like that, but only trunk. And then use feature toggles instead of feature branches to separate out code that you don't want to be turned on in environments but you're just going down one pipeline. And this is kind of, this has become standard practice. This is Google, the entire Google code base is one, they, this is trunk. Everything goes into trunk, right? And they're pretty big, right? And they can, they can manage it, right? Facebook is the same thing. Netflix is the same thing. Tesla works that way. Um, this is the, the, the time that you spend in this merge process is, is uh, time that you want to get back. Um, CI. So, we have to step back. The stage is kind of a bit of an overloaded term in here because we're thinking of stages as these in deployment instances, right? Um, dev, QA, showcase, right? But in Go, the stage can be like a little more granular, 
than um, the instances. Um, so we'll drill down, right? These are, these are like 12 stages. Uh, there are like four instances, three stages for each instance. Um, uh, so here we'll drill down into just one of these stages, the showcase instance, right? We actually in Go, we're going to build three stages. We're going to build the software. We're going to test the software. We're going to release the software. And we're going to do that for each stage, right? So we end up with something. I'm not saying you have to do it this way. This is like a model that we're using, right? So you have, um, so we're ha we have these, these four state instances that we're, we're deploying to. And in each one, we're building, testing, releasing, then building, testing, releasing, building, testing, releasing, building, testing, releasing, right? Um, so back again, here's the, each one of those rows is a, is a pipeline. A pipeline is triggered by some change. So every change in source code kicks off a new instance of the pipeline. And every, the goal in CD is that every commit is a release candidate, right? You want to get from a development perspective, when you push code, then you want to have this mentality of like, this code could actually go to production and it wouldn't break anything, right? Even if it's turned off, whatever, but every, every commit is, um, so, that, so commit, the pipeline becomes like the uh, uh, medieval feature quest, right? Where the hero goes after the girl, right? And he's got to go after all of these challenges in order to get there, and maybe he's slayed in, in the middle of the, that's the red things, right? Where you have failures, right? You're slayed by the dragon, right? But the point is to get all the way through to green, and the emphasis is on uh, keeping the build in release-ready state all of the time. And so when you get to, when you really have a CD practice, the, the keeping the build in release, steady, release ready state is actually more important than getting new work done, right? You, all, you want your team to always prioritize keeping the release, keeping the build in release ready state, right? That's the first priority. If there's something that's preventing that, then you do that first. So here we're gonna kind of punch around in the tool a little bit. So you have the pipeline and then on the left-hand side, if you click on the little link there, then you get this dialog that tells you the changes that, draw, that are driving this pipeline build. So you get the committer, the commit message, and the commit hashes that are, the, that are driving this instance. So you can navigate and see what's going on. Um, this is a drill down into one pipeline instance. So the stages are across the top. Across the uh, right-hand side, you've got like a stage history, previous runs of the same stage. And um, in the middle there, you've got the commit has hashes of the build materials, the source code, right? So you can see what's going on. And then on the left, you've got that where it says deploy content in this case. You've got a link that goes into the console. So in Go, you get this console view for every build, every run, every time. You get the, the view of all in detail. And this console log, in this case, goes on for pages, 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 pages of detail. So when something breaks, you can go through and see what actually happened on the console, right? So these are... The, the way that the tool organizes this stuff and presents it to you is what makes the tool, like, valuable. Um, this is the, that stage history that was on the right-hand side. And so here, you've got different runs of the same, of the same different pipeline runs of the same build. And here, you can, you can click on that config changed link and get a diff of what, actu what actual code changes went into the differences. So if you've got, if you particularly get this case where you, like, you deliver software and everything's good, and then like a week later, you find out that it doesn't, you know, it's broken in some way that nobody really noticed, right? Functionally broken. And so you can go back to that release and you go here and you can see what code went in at that point, right? So the tool helps you out with that. Um, so, you know, once you can get all the way through, right, on this journey to fully automated deployments and you gain enough trust in your automated tests that you can actually, you're willing to click that button to do an automated deployment based on what's there, a really interesting thing happens, right? The decision to release software is no longer a technical decision, right? So if you're a project manager, right, you don't have to go and ask the devs if what's done, right? Because you know how that conversation goes, right? Is it done? Oh, yeah, right. Is it, I mean, is it, how done is it, right? <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, it's, it's totally done, right? Well, I mean, is it, is it done, done, or is it, is it, is it done? I mean, I, Right? So, you know, you want to resolve all that stuff. So, this, so, but the software that's on Showcase is done, right? So you no longer have, this, this is what you're really going to, right? So you, so you get this transparency out of the process, right? So you, and you want to build this confidence that what's on Showcase is what's done. 
and uh, you don't have to review it. And so th at that point, the conversation, the release decision becomes a conversation really between the project manager and the product owner or the customer, right? To say, okay, here's a release candidate, right? This is the stuff that's in it. Do you want the stuff in production? Because if you want the stuff in production, we'll click the button, you'll get the stuff in production, right? If it's not what you want, then we'll keep working on it, right? But th so that, it really, um, it changes everything, right? So you think about it, right? With Agile, the Agile recognizes that when stakeholders first see working software, it changes their perception of what the requirements are, right? So in Agile, we try to like, we say, okay, what do you want? Here are the requirements. We try to like build them something and show it to them so that they can say, oh, no, 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 so I, what I actually want is this, right? So you still have time to like build what they actually need, right? And that's a good thing, right? That's what part of what Agile is about. With continuous delivery, it's taking that same idea really all the way through to the delivery side, right? To, um, uh, to change this relationship between the, the stakeholder, the customer, and the, the build team. And this really implies some really much richer relationships with the customer. That's really where a lot of the value is. The value is not so much in like saving time through automation so you don't have to do the DevOps work every time, right? The, the real value is in how it changes your relationship with your customer, builds a trust relationship. The competitive advantage of it is awesome. The alternative, right, is like you spend a lot of time like fixing things. Right, low quality, Deming says, low quality means high cost and loss of competitive position. So, um, so let's look like more in more detail of the tool, Go itself, right? So uh, Go is, it's a server and it's agents, right? So you, to do Go, you got some, you've got a, you, you download the server, you install it to, a, to your server instance, to a VM, wherever it is that you're gonna run. And then everywhere you're gonna build software, you install an agent, right? So that's a lot like Jenkins. Jenkins has a master-only mode, but it's, most of these have the same concept of agents and, and a master server, right? And a build pipeline is a sequence of stages that are pinned to, um, to resources. So, um, so here's the, we're gonna like drill down into this stuff, right? The, these concepts. How to declare build materials, how to set up build stages, how to set up jobs for, to run in stages, how to get agents to run your jobs, um, how to configure tasks, and how to use uh, trusted build artifacts, okay? And um, so th this thing, one of the things, that, this takeaway that we hope to get out of this is um, to understand this distinction between uh, build materials and build artifacts, right? Materials are like the ingredients going into your recipe, right? The source code is going in. They're the ingredients. You're, you're constantly changing the recipe, right? That's why you're building the stuff. Um, and the, um, the, uh, uh, the artifacts are the cupcakes that come out of the oven, right, after you bake the recipe, right? They're, the, they're a result of the process. And so you're always tinkering with the recipe. No two batches are going to be the same. And so... Uh, Go supports this concept of trusted artifacts that allow you to have these con contractually consistent cupcakes within the context of a given build pipeline. And so for like a Java build, the Java binary is the contractually consistent object, right? That you build this job, you only build the binary once in the build pipeline, and then you deliver the built, bi the built binary down the stream so you never have to worry about whether or not somehow it's built a little different in production than it is on, in earlier stages, right? So in our kind of case study thing, we're gonna look at the Drupal database as the artifact, as the cupcake, right, is that we're gonna bake. So it's a little different concept than how most Drupal sites are built, and hopefully it'll be stimulating discussion. So we'll come back to that, but let's kind of take a step back, right? The first thing you do when you set up a pipeline is you declare build materials, right? You say, here's my source code, this is where it is and then Go is gonna go and pull that. Whenever that changes, then Go is gonna like kick off a build, just like Jenkins would, right, or any of these, these, uh, these tools. Um, and the, Go, the agents are gonna take care of like pulling the source code onto your server and getting you started. Um, and so to get uh, the build to kick off automatically whenever your material changes, you've just gotta check off this automatically, uh, automatic pipeline scheduling. That's what, that's what gives you uh, once you do that, you declare your materials and you check that box, you've got CI at that point, right? Uh, not necessarily your tests, but you've got CI. Um, so, so far we've covered build materials, the triggers, and stages. So next from here we drill down into 
jobs, tasks, and artifacts. And then you're going to have the whole picture. So um, a job is still a meta concept, right? Um, it's uh, to, uh, jo uh, stage is a container for jobs. And so you declare, the, you declare these jobs. And for them to run, Go server goes and finds some agent that's suitable for running a job. And it hands the job off to the agent to execute, right? So Go, the server's the orchestrator, the agent's the executor. And this process of matching up um, jobs to agents is just a tagging, right? So you set up tags in the agent that says, uh, my website dev build, and you set up uh, the same tags in the job, and then the server goes out and finds that registered agent wherever it happens to be, right? Um, so resources are effectively just tags. This is tag matching to get your jobs and your agents to match up. Uh, and here's the agent view, right? So this is a list on that right-hand side of these uh, tags um, that, um, that allow the, job, the Go server jobs to find the agents. Um, so if a pipeline is a container for stages and stages are a container for jobs, right, then you'll probably find no surprise that jobs are containers for tasks. And tasks are commands to be executed, right? So finally, we're getting to actually doing something, right? Up until this point, it's all like meta configuration stuff, and the tasks are actually doing something, right? So if you've got a back of a napkin deployment, which is fine, right? So you go and um, you get your napkin out, and you go and SSH into your server, and you start like executing all the commands on the napkin, right? And that's like your base build, right? And so the next thing is you write that into a batch script, and you run the batch script. And then the next thing is you write it in Python or something like that. Right? It's, all Go is doing is, is taking your napkin and like bundling it all up and automating it so you're doing the same thing every time all the way through. And the task is where this actually happens, right? Um, so um, so we're gonna, we'll drill down into task, but so now that we have all of the components, these meta components sort of defined, so let's take a look at the architecture of Go because hopefully that'll help you understand uh, what you're looking at is you're looking at various CD tools, right? So um, uh, Go has got these carefully considered abstractions providing tasks inside of jobs, inside of stages, inside of pipelines with a mix of parallel and se sequential processing. So pipelines and jobs are running in parallel. They can run at the same time. And um, stages and tasks are running serially, right? And this was a, this was a carefully considered design. If you try to build your pipeline in Jenkins, then you're going to be inventing your own abstractions, right? How you want to be modeling this stuff, right? So now you become the architect. Um, the, the guiding point in Go was this, have you ever heard of Joe Splotsky's The Law of Leaky Abstractions, right? That was what was driving this. And Joe Splotsky says, right, our goal is to have powerful enough abstractions, the right ones, to make it possible to model your path to production and effectively, and more importantly, to remodel it as you learn and evolve over time, while at the same time resist the temptation to continuously introduce new unnecessary abstractions that are only going to make things more difficult in the long run because they will be leaky, right? So it's true anywhere in software architecture, right, is you're dealing with this question of what is the right abstraction for the job that you're trying to do, and we try to use patterns in order to avoid the process of us and constantly reinventing our own uh, probably leaky abstractions. And so Go helps that go out. Yep? OK. So um, drilling down into this uh, task configuration, right? We have, um, here's like a copy task, right? Everybody knows C copy, right, CP. And uh, this is how you'd configure it in, um, in Go, right? You have got. Um, the command, uh, the arguments for the command on each line. Um, you've, you know, the command obviously is going to run on a server somewhere. So, the command either has to be on the on the the, the path, or you have to specify the full path, or it's not going to run. And the command is going to be executed by a user, the user that the agent is installed in. So the that user has to have the rights on that system to do the things that you want it to do. They, they should be self-evident, but you'll spend a lot of time. Getting, you always spend that kind of stuff, and DevOps, right? Getting that stuff right is a big part of the job. Um, so the second part of our job, um, this job, is a task. It's a Fing call to build the system, to build our Drupal site, right? And so Fing is Apache Ant for PHP. 
It's a target-based XML scripting language. And there's, there's a Lullabot primer on it that's awesome. Um, so, you know, these build systems are generally, they're either target-based like Ant and Fing or uh, uh, product-based like Maven and Make. And the target-based systems are like easy to get started with, but they're XML, so they get like long-haired and hard to deal with. The, uh, make, the build, these, uh, these Make systems uh, are, I find them like hard to like jump in the middle of a broken process and figure out what's going on. So I prefer the Fing stuff. But the main thing is that Go isn't like imposing a choice on, or a, a way to do this stuff, right? The Go is an orchestrator of your tools and processes that you choose. So whatever works for you, right? The, the devil you know is probably the best one. Um, so here's the task dialog for our Fing call, right? When we get down to calling user bin Fing, right? And the dash F says what file to load, the build.xml, um, deploy dev is the Fing target that we're actually gonna execute. And so this is what the Fing actually looks like, right? This is this, is this XML Fing code, right? that gets down to this call that says deploy website, and the deploy website, then we get down to the next target, right? And so this sets up the Drupal site, right? And it calls at the end of that red box, site install. install. And um, so uh, just to show that like, there's nothing up our sleeve here, right? This is a drill all the way down to a Drush call, right? So Drush is still doing the heavy lifting in your deployment, right? This is, you're just orchestrating the, the sequence and order this is being done in, plus you're marrying all your Drush stuff with all the other DevOps system configuration stuff that goes along with it. Um, and then Drush is supported in Fing with this, uh, it's an add-on called, um, what is it called, uh, drushtask.php. So if you're gonna use Fing, you've gotta get drushtask.php and then you're in business, right? So, um, so you run site install, then you build out the site build stuff. This would be Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 it'll be. This is where your um, configuration management stuff is gonna come in, where that whole red block is today, right? This is all features and stuff like that is what we do in Drupal 7, right, to build the site out. So we build the whole site out in code from there. Um, so, um, you know, there's, I, I could go through, I've got like another 10 slides of the detail going in, but I'm, a, I'm and we could drill down into that, but probably we'd be better spent like jumping to the discussion rather than drilling through because probably we provoked a lot of questions, right? So, um, do, do we have any? Uh, we have two Senate questions. So the first Senate question is from Chris Lieben, who is actually uh, the first one to boldly ask the question. Um, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, how do you how do you sell CD right? And there's other, it's kind of in a similar space of how do you how do you sell Agile right? And I'm I'm not sh I'm I'm working on that right. That's why I'm here <laughs> having this conversation right. And it, it um, uh, and uh, w you know the tact that I'm on right is to, is Deming right? Dem you know like take Deming as your guide to say we're not talking about adding on a whole series of costs to your project, what we're trying to do is to get to higher productivity, right? So if you're, if you're selling it inside the organization, we're talking about selling it based on productivity, right? Because who can be against better productivity, right? How, how can you be against that? Nobody wants to pay for quality, but everybody's willing to go for higher productivity. So you keep the emphasis on that, and then quality is a vehicle to get to better productivity. Right, you got to build quality in. Now, if you're if you're selling it to the client, then product they're not really they don't really like want to hear about your productivity problems, right? Because if you bring that up, they're saying, "Oh, you've got productivity problems. Maybe I should be talking to somebody else." Right? And so there, really, it has to do with um, with uh, responding to them on a faster basis. And in that sense, it's not a question of like selling it to them, like saying. Uh, this is what we want to do, and you've got to pay us to be able to do this other stuff. It's like gradually getting to the point where these are the capabilities that you have. It's not like it's a big expense. It's your time, right? And once you have the skills, it'll just be what you do. It won't cost you to be able to do these things. It's just the ramp time to get there. And once you get there, then the way you sell it is the fact that they, the customer says, well, you know, we think that this is what we want, 
And then like the next day you say, well, here it is right here, right? You get, you, like, you get to where you can deliver like small incremental changes quickly and it changes the relationship with the customer and it changes the trust relationship with them. And then once you have the trust relationship with them, then you're on the basis where you can say, you know, especially with a larger, a larger organization, you can say, now what we want to do is we want to help you transform your organization along the lines of these practices, right? So you can expand the scope of your engagement with the customer, right? And this is your book right here, by the way. Here you go. So next question. Here, come on up. And next question is from Tarrant Marshall. Uh, and he asks, what integration points does going as a cloud or project tool then give you typically services? Can you <sighs> Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, what integration points does Go have with cloud or project tools and do ticket systems? Yeah. What integration uh, points does Go have with the, with ticket systems and other other ones? Whose book is this? Uh, Tarrant Here you go, Tarrant. One up. Um, it does. I'm not like a big expert in that part of it because I'm not using. There is a, um, there's like a, an integration interface in Go that I haven't delved into. And let's see if we can jump over right here. So here's uh, Go. So hopefully we, oh, we don't, we're actually not up on screen, are we? Uh, so this is, uh, if we take off mirroring, this is probably going to kill me, right? Okay, so here's Go right here. And then over here in the admin section, um, you have, uh, or no, actually it's, uh, yeah, admin, pipelines, and then for the pipeline, you've got um, the, the integration, those integration points are over here, right? They, they're plugins, right? The tools are plugins. Go has a plugin interface, so, and it's an open source project, and so there's some stuff that already exists. I know that our own Mingle project management integrates some other tools, um, integrate and other integrations are being built as we go um, and uh, the whole interface is there to create new interfaces going on uh, kind of as long as we're, we're along this go also you know th this whole thing of the pipeline go provides you a GUI for configuring the pipeline and all of it uh, resolves to this XML and so you can actually modify the pipeline in this context right here so that's part of like the integration the pl plugins so that's kind of, here's the plug-in tab here, right? So um, it's kind of a weak answer just because I'm not that familiar with that part of the system, but um, it's all open. E everything can be done. What is done, I can't tell you. Another yeah, what do you got? Yep, so from Paul Foxworthy, uh, could tasks in Go for CV be declarative like Puppet rather than declarative? Uh, uh, yeah, in theory, we're kind of really doing different things. Um, uh, like in our world, we're building, uh, we build our servers with OpenStack, we provision them with Chef, and all that's done, right, before we're talking about doing our Go builds, right? So in, at least in my, because it's a big world, there's a lot of different cases, right? And I live in my world, and so maybe I don't understand uh, your context exactly. But basically, our build is on the application level, right? So we're, we're just going through an application build process. And typically what we're doing is orchestrating a series of steps that you would be doing on the command line. Certainly, I mean, uh, you can be calling batch scripts instead of commands, and the batch scripts can then be contextual in terms of what they're doing, right? I'm not doing anything like that. But sure, yeah, why not? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you can certainly, um, uh, uh, you can s set up four Jenkins uh, instances, right? And then kind of write some glue code to put them together to make a pipeline. Um, but then, you know, you'll be, you'll be declaring your own relationship, right? The relationship between commit and QA and QA and showcase and showcase and production are all going to be kind of your code that's going to make that happen. And if you want to do artifacts, then you're going to be using some Jenkins plugin to make it happen. You can do it, sure. There's definitely, there's, you can definitely do it, right? So it's just a question of uh, how much of this stuff that you want to get done in your tool, have your tool do for you, and how much of it you really want to do yourself, right? So we want to concentrate on 
building and delivering changes in the software for a customer, not really. We want to have the tool, the technical aspects and the tool, we want to try to bury those so they're not really what we're, our team is dealing with all the time, right? We want to be dealing with the changes that we need to deliver with the customer as much as possible. And, and there's a lot of tools at this point, right? There's Bamboo and Electric Cloud, and uh, there's tools you can pay for, there's free tools. Um, Yeah. Uh, from Steve Woolley, do you have any suggestions on how best to deliver database updates? And I'm assuming that's schema changes when the code base depends on set updates. On set updates? Uh, so if you're delivering a database update, like a schema yeah. change, how do you um, best deliver that update on the code base and the build base? Right. So how do you, how do you deal with this thing with, with schema changes, database updates, et cetera? And it's a really, really cool topic. It's kind of a big one. And the, the path that I went down, or we went down, was that um, we build the entire Drupal site from scratch with every build from site install. So we start with a blank database, and then we do everything in code to build on every commit, right? And then uh, after the sites, we do that, and we build everything from code, then we build our content from code as well. In other words, we use, in our case, what we're doing is we take um, a non-production facing site that the content editors, the marketing people, post their content to this non-production facing site. And then we run um, a node export. We export their content to JSON. We commit it to Git. And so when we get in the build, right, so now we build the entire site from scratch, everything in code. And then uh, once it's built, then we start importing the content from Git. And so we can end up reproducing the entire site from scratch all the way through to a, the production parallel instance. And we deploy that to production right beside the, uh, the, uh, the existing production site in another document route with its own database, right? So it's sitting right there, ready to go. And then, so then you have the deal, you have the, so any schema changes, obviously they're already in the new thing. If you have schema changes that affect the node import, you've got to deal with those in code. But um, uh, so the thing that you've got to deal with at that point at actual release is any data that's actually production driven. So if you've got like a Facebook Web 2.0 site, this doesn't make much sense. But if you've got a typical, typical corporate property, most of the content's being driven from marketing forward, not coming from public, right? And so then architecturally, we reduce the, uh, these production-generated issues by moving comments to Discus, so we don't have to worry about comments, right? We moved web forms to Marketo, so they're actually not in the Drupal database anymore. Those are our, you may not want to make those choices, but those are choices we made to get uh, our content as much being driven from our own source rather than coming from public. And then any remaining uh, data that's in tables that only comes from production Right, that, that data could have changed the second before release, right? So you obviously you can't, right? You have to get it from that source. And so in that case, you've got these two sites, there's in separate document routes, they're sitting right next to each other out there in production. And so when it comes time to do the cutover, you click that cutover button, then you put the production site in uh, maintenance mode, do a SQL sync of those, those individual tables that need to get synced from uh, production to the new, from the outgoing to the incoming site, and then you simply rewrite a sim link to what Apache is loading for production, so you don't have to even have to bounce Apache. So the whole thing takes a process of like the cutover takes like less than a second, and since most of the sites behind Varnish anyway, that n nobody will ever see any any. It's like totally seamless uh, down, um, cutover time, and we've done this with a Drupal Commerce site, right? And so with Drupal Commerce, you actually have large sets of tables that are production oriented. Right? So you have all the customer data, all the order data, all that stuff, right? And we could do that, and it would, we could sync, SQL sync it between the two site instances, um, and it just takes a second to do it. It doesn't take very long at all to do that part. Um, and one of the advantages, once you look at that kind of architecture of doing things, then think about what a rollback means at that point, right? A rollback means you just rewrite the sim link back from one site, because the other site's still there, right? The one you just cut away from. You just rewrite the sim link and you're back on the other side. So the, it re reduces the risk tremendously, right? Reduces the time and the risk, right? And which, is the, which are the main goals, right? You wanna get the time, you wanna get the risk, burn the risk out of delivery, right? Get rid of that fear so that you're just like concentrating on all those issues should be done at that point. 
So there's other ways to deal, this thing with like dealing with schema changes, data changes in releases, the, w the one thing you definitely, I always want to avoid is touching that production database in a, in a, in a site upgrade, right? Because you never really actually know for sure, no matter how many times you've tried it, you never know for certain what's going to happen, right? And so then if something goes wrong, your best case is like you've made a database dump, you went into maintenance mode, you tried your sub site upgrade, you tried to test it out, it didn't work, and so you're going back to your database dump and your window's bigger and you're sweating and it's the fear factor is higher, and, right? So in this case, it's like, you know, there's no way you can go wrong in that. So we're out of time, right? But I'm still here. So um, my uh, Twitter handle is August1914. This is however I got that. Um, so uh, tweet me there. Uh, I'm, I'm mgodek at thoughtworks.com. Email, email me there. And um, if you want to have a larger discussion about this, I'm more than willing. Thank you very much. And <laughs>